Welcome back, everybody. Well, I was really pleasantly surprised by the response to the first episode of this new series, playing the uh, Hearts of Iron 4 mod, End of a New Beginning, beginning in 1857 as the United States. Uh, if you didn't see that first episode, there's a link in the description. It'll take you back to episode one. Just be aware of the first seven minutes or so, there's some glitching with my microphone. Restarted the game around minute seven of that video, and then everything was smooth after that. Should be good to go moving forward. It's August 1859. This episode is primarily going to be centered around the American Civil War that's going to be breaking out and maybe the aftermath, depending on how long the war takes. So let's dive in and see what happens. All right, well, we're going to take a look at naval research now. We haven't even gotten an early gunboat yet, which is the 1800 research so we're going to do that and looking down the road here you can see all the way up to 1860 gunboat hall we can get prototype monitors uh, and then eventually you move down the road here and you start to get uh, some more substantial ships like torpedo boats and in fact let's zoom out here i guess we can't destroyers we've got cruisers down here um, we've got early frigates down here so there's actually some other things here i guess that's probably the road we should be going down uh, is early forget and all of that. All right, we have recovered from the panic of 1857, so we've completed that focus tree. Uh, we are into the year that Abraham Lincoln was elected and secession began, uh, but I don't believe we are able to choose anything else yet, so we have to go back um, over here. We could choose one of these, but I'm actually... I'm thinking what I'd rather do is just not do a national focus because by not doing a national focus, you actually gain additional legislative points. So I'm going to gain two per day. I'd rather stockpile those knowing the Civil War's coming. Taking a look at our research right now, we're working on oil refining. Uh, we are researching the Model 1857 12-pounder Napoleon cannon, the 1850 frigate hull, and the Model 1861 percussion rifle musket. Uh, that's the Springfield rifle. So uh, all of the technology that was pretty common in the American Civil War, the 12-pounder Napoleon, uh, probably the most recognizable gun during that time period because they're all over a lot of Civil War battlefields. And, of course, the uh, Springfield rifle, very, very common during that time. It's March of 1860. We're just a few months away from secession, the secession crisis beginning. Here we go. Political parties on slavery. The issue of slavery has been debated in politics for a while now, but now political parties are getting more involved in the slavery debate. The Republican parties announced that they have nominated Illinois politician Abraham Lincoln, who wishes for slavery not to expand west. The Southern Democrats have elected John Breckinridge, current vice president under Buchanan, who supports expansion of slavery into the west, while Northern Democrats chose Stephen Douglas as a moderate on the issue outside of these parties. The Constitutional Union Party is led by John Bell, who aims his presidency on healing the country after decades of debating over slavery. And, of course, it was those three others that all split the vote and allowed for Lincoln to be elected with something like 40% of the vote, which is kind of about what Bill Clinton got in the 1992 election. A lot of people forget that or they weren't around at that time. Uh, Ross Perot ran a third party, a strong 30, third party candidacy that kind of split some of the conservative vote and allowed for Clinton to get uh, an election. All right, so we're gonna upgrade to the 12 pounder Napoleon for our guns now. Okay, so here we go. This is where we get to decide who it is that's gonna win this election. Now, obviously we could choose someone like Stephen Douglas or John Breckinridge and probably push the Push the can down the road, kick the can down the road a little bit again, but I think we're going to go ahead and just allow this to, to unfold. We're going to send congratulations to Lincoln, who has been elected president. We just researched hygiene, which is nice. Um, then we're going to go ahead and watch these events unfold as they did historically. I think historically the first to secede would have been South Carolina in December of 1860. Now, one of the things that people don't realize is that it was not a foregone conclusion that some of the northern southern states, in other words, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that they would secede. Initially, it was just what they call the cotton states or the deep south that seceded. 
Uh, Virginia, some of these others, didn't secede until after the war had actually begun. It was when Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers, when Fort Sumter had been fired upon, that they kind of got off the fence and decided to join the Confederacy. Here we go. Now this is where you get to choose. Do you want to take on the role of playing the South or do you want to take on the North? We are going to take on the North. And there South Carolina becomes the first to secede. Right now they are the Confederate States of America. Uh, I don't believe we're actually at war with them yet. Uh, I'll need to take a look and see how this is all going to unfold. Uh, so looking at the current wars, it appears no. Uh, we're not actually at war just yet. So it's unfolding now. Mississippi has joined the Confederacy. Florida has joined the Confederacy. Alabama. Of course, it was Mississippi's Jefferson Davis who gets chosen to be the president. Uh, Jefferson Davis had been Secretary of War. I believe he had one time been the Commandant of West Point. Um, he was a senator from Mississippi. I, at the time, he was chosen to be the president. Louisiana joins the Confederacy. Probably see Texas next, much to the chagrin of Sam Houston, who did not want to see that happen. Okay, so now let's take a look. Be it what, be it that they stay told sympathies for the Confederacy or they simply wish to remain neutral, uh, a number of states, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, Missouri, Oklahoma, and West Virginia have become militar demilitarized zones. So now we can't move troops into any of this area there in the center. So we're into April of 1861. This is when the Civil War began. I would expect the events to unfold likewise. And it began when Lincoln was attempting to resupply the fort, uh, Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor. Uh, they kind of drove off that ship and then they opened fire directly on Fort Sumter. Uh, of course, one of the people who was uh, one of the officers at Fort Sumter that day was Abner Doubleday, who is falsely credited with inventing baseball. Uh, and his commanding officer was Robert Anderson. Both Doubleday and Anderson, I believe, are both buried at West Point in the National Cemetery there. Uh, we're doing some research here, and we're actually kind of caught up now on the uh, artillery. So I think now we'll go ahead and uh, focus on innovation. How about that? That's going to take a while on that one. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look over at Army Research. I think we're pretty well caught up there, too. I don't think we're going to need camels. Uh, you have, your country has to have at least one cord state in the Middle East or Africa in order to do that anyway. We're a little ahead on being able to do any of those things. Military vehicles? No, not really. Let's look at socioeconomics and humanities. We're going to research workers' rights. All right, let's do that. And then let's go ahead and watch. We should be... Actually, I think we're already past. Here it is. The South demands Fort Sumter. We will force the Confederacy to strike first. That's exactly what happens. There it is. Rise, my minions. <laughs> the American Civil War. Here we go. The Confederate States of America changes their diplomatic status with us to declare war. The war is on. Additional states have joined. There you have it. Everything's kind of along the border there, but I think we're going to be okay. Let's go ahead now to the American Civil War national focus. First things first, we fortify Washington. Washington during the American Civil War was the most heavily fortified city on the entire earth. Uh, that actually got bypassed. That's cool. Enforce the Anaconda Plan. So let's go ahead and do that. And in the meantime, I need to... Apparently, I still have Robert E. Lee as my general since I, I put him there. I wonder if we lost the other southern generals or if I still have any of those. Interesting. So we still have Joseph Johnston, spelled wrong, but Stonewall Jackson and others. So that's kind of cool. So here we are. We're getting everybody onto the border here. We're going to have to defend so we can keep them from taking any of my territory. Well, there it says, uh, when our messengers offered Robert E. Lee to become commander of the United States Army in response to the Confederate uprising, he sadly refused. Said he could not turn against his state. So there, we just lost uh, Lee, but we gained Grant, Sherman, 
We're going to end the Monroe Doctrine temporarily. That's fine. Rally around the flag. Oh, we'll rally around the flag. Boys, we'll rally once again. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. Uh, let's see. We'll put Sherman in charge of the other army. We definitely need some more divisions. So let's go ahead and ramp up recruitment of infantry regiments with support. Get as many of those going as we possibly can. Let me look at our production situation. Obviously, we need a lot right now. All right, we've got some unassigned divisions. Actually, I, I'm sending these divisions under Sherman over here to this border with Texas, see if maybe we can kind of go in from that direction. But honestly, I don't think that's probably the way I should go. I think it's better off to focus over here on the east. I'm going to go ahead and put Sherman over here on the border with Virginia. So the plan is I'm... I actually have Sherman in the east and Grant in the west, so kind of backwards from how the war ended up. I'm actually still in the process of assigning armies to the two, and it looks like we still have divisions available, so we can go ahead and form a third army, uh, and we'll go ahead and put this one under James McPherson. always been a big fan of his. My uh, fourth great-grandfather actually served in McPherson's Corps, and then later on in his army. Of course, he was the, the only Union Army commander killed during the Civil War. He was killed outside of Atlanta in July of uh, 1864. Yeah, absolutely loved, not only by his men, but by the other generals who served with him. Completed the uh, Enforce the Anaconda Plan. Let's go ahead now and uh, look at where we want to go here. Enact martial law? I don't think so. Um... French Empire gains reminded of CSA slavery, so we're trying to hurt their opinion of the CSA to keep them out of the war. So interesting thing here, I'm you know me being an Ohioan, I couldn't help but point out the fact that all three of my generals right now, Grant, Sherman, and McPherson, have something in common, and that is that they're all born in Ohio. So that's kind of cool. So switch my national focus to going after Civil War tactics now. Um, so there's aggressive planning, which gains base war support. There's defensive planning, which gains base stability. Uh, I want to go aggressive. I want to try and end this thing as quickly as possible, as can be seen by the fact that I've already lost 90,000 men, and it's only August of 1861. There's already 120,000 casualties, but right now it's 3 to 1 in the Confederates' favor, so that can't continue. So we're going to have to probably find some places to focus the attacks and then other places just kind of hold on and try to you know look for places that we can push through we're getting ready to break through out here in the west over in texas we're already breaking through uh, it looks like we're going to break through in arkansas we've taken a little bit of territory in tennessee and i'm hoping we can break through into virginia soon okay we've chosen aggressive planning now we're going to go with either the ulysses plan or the Sherman plan. I'm not sure which one uh, is the better way to go here. National spirit planning assault, division speed. So it looks like either one's going to kind of do the same thing. So we'll go with the Sherman plan. You can see we're starting to make some headway. Taking a little bit of Tennessee, we're starting to take northern North Carolina, or Arkansas. Uh, we're taking a little bit of Texas, and hopefully very soon here we're going to be able to start pushing through into Virginia as well. So it seems as though he has largely left Virginia undefended here. So uh, I brought all these guys that were trying to fight through the mountains, which was stupid on my part, brought them around over to Washington, and now we're marching pretty well unimpeded. Uh, General Meade is down into Richmond. Meanwhile, uh, we're losing a lot of divisions out west. It just seems like a war of attrition that has not gone well for me, although we're starting to make some progress. I think maybe the, the heavy advantage that I have in resources and manpower is starting to show even though i'm completely out of manpower at the moment so i'm going to go ahead and take a look at mobilization laws and see if we can move up to uh, conscription now i don't know if i can do this by executive order i'm going to try we'll see if it actually works this way i'm not entirely sure uh, let's see uh, nothing so far 
All right, so we did successfully by uh, executive order change the mobilization law. We're now going to do or change the uh, yeah the mobilization law. We're now going to try and get a vote for the reform toward early mobilization here. Uh, let's vote in a month. Give time, hopefully, for it to pass. And let's see if we can go ahead and take Richmond. Oh, we have, in fact, taken Richmond already. So I don't know where that puts the war. We've lost so many men. 301,000 casualties, 77,000 for him. Manpower probably still pretty even. But we are far from a victory. We've got to take a lot more than just Richmond. All right, so once every 30 days we can use executive order to reform things. I'm going to put uh, our military spending all the way up to 5%. Um, I'm going to lose political stability to do this, but this is going to make my military much more effective. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, if we look down here at governmental policies, at the military spending going up to 5%, you can see uh, it hurts my legislative power gain, but it gives you bonuses to attack, to defense, to military leader cost, to planning speed, to division organization, to army experience gain. Those are all things that are going to be helpful for me right now. I can always go back and change it after the war is over. All right, so now that we have completed the scorched earth national focus down here, that's going to give me division speed, supply consumption, and division attack bonuses. That supply is a big deal right now because I'm having huge supply issues, which is why my armies aren't very effective at the moment. Uh, so this next one will help a lot with division attrition, recovery rate, things like that. But right now, what I want to do is do martial law here. That only takes 20 days. And then after that, I can do glory, glory, which is going to give me a 3% bonus to recruitable population. And then here, hallelujah, uh, gives a war support 5% bonus, a reinforce rate bonus. So those things are all helpful as well. All right, we're going to use this executive order again. This time we're going to go from civilian economy to war economy. I should have done that sooner. And I've got so many uh, available government points, legislative points, that I can certainly do that. There's martial law. And now we'll go to glory, glory. And this is going to get me that manpower I need because we just have so, this manpower dries up every month so quickly. You can see here it's almost down to zero already. And you watch, it'll, it'll disappear real quick because as fast as I'm losing men, I'm hurling them back into my armies. You can see, let's take a look right now what I've actually got in the field. I've got 375,000 in the field, 58,000 more that are currently training. Into May of 1862, and I've basically ordered a halt to all of the advances on this side. You can see all the, the yellow exclamation points there. Those are places where we're just not getting enough supply to be able to sustain any kind of advances. So um, we are advancing. We just took Richmond. I had taken it once before and lost it. This time I think we'll hold it. Uh, and we're pushing only along this front with General Meade and everybody else is just kind of sitting tight. So all of my reinforcements are pouring into uh, that area there. And I, I, did, I did get that uh, national focus that allows for uh, even higher uh, conscripts now. You can see now we've got 3% Civil War conscription plus 2% for my um, law change to limited conscription. Uh, so those things are allowing me to add additional troops. And we're going to start pushing here. We'll push into Virginia pretty soon. And once we can get through these mountains, I think it's going to get a little easier to march down into North Carolina. We're just going to sweep around from this way and then maybe start pushing from up here if we have the manpower by then. So out here, the Confederates have been marching through unhindered from Texas through Arizona into California, Utah, Nevada. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I've got these new units that are ready to come into the field. We're going to throw them in right here in California. That's where they're going to appear. And then we're going to put an army together to first defend and then hurl them back. So let's go ahead and get a new army going. We we'll need a commander for that. Uh, Phil Sheridan looks like the guy for this task. So he's got eight divisions. Let's go ahead and throw him down there and at least stem the tide. And then we'll give him orders to start hurling them back. And we'll push them back about that far for now. 
All right, now that we're making progress over in Virginia, I've gone ahead and given new orders for all armies to advance. There's the Ulysses plan. What we're trying to do right now is over here on the national focus, I'm trying to get strike at the Confederacy, which gives me a big reduction in attrition, a bonus to recovery rate, and a bonus to reinforcement rate. So I can get those new troops into the field a little quicker when possible, but I have to complete the Ulysses plan first. Technology, we just uh, researched sewer, sewage system there, so that gives me a 4% bonus in monthly population. Uh, early hospitals, we're a little ahead on. We can go here, Metropolitan, and do that. So it's uh, July 1862. You can see we're starting to have some success advancing on all fronts. Uh, Sheridan's about to get in position where he can start striking against the enemy. He doesn't quite have what he needs yet. I can, I can get a few more not fully formed divisions into the field just to give him a little more manpower. That'll get him up to 13 divisions that probably don't quite have all they need. Let's see how he stacks up. All right, inferior enemy, so let's do it. And we'll tell him to be aggressive. We're just going to try to end this thing as quick as we possibly can. And now the Sioux have declared war on us. So that's not a helpful situation, right, when we're starting to make inroads into the Confederacy. Uh, so where do we have the Sioux? I guess this would be them right here. So suddenly we have this to deal with on our border. So we're going to have to send a few divisions up there to deal with that. Uh, we are starting to make a little bit. Oh, well, we were making headway over here, but it looks like they cut me off. So Sheridan not having a great deal of success out in the west at the moment. But things are going really well in the east. You can see we've taken the eastern half of North Carolina. We've taken almost all of Virginia now. We've taken good chunks of Tennessee, a good half or so of Arkansas, and a little tiny bit of northern Texas. All right, so it's going to be George Thomas's job with these five divisions to hopefully contain and then eliminate the threat from the Sioux who have declared war on me. I'm hoping five divisions will be enough to get that done once we get them into position. Uh, I've got some research to deal with here. We're researching mobile army uh, in doctrine. And let's see what else we can do over here. Uh, we could probably go back and look at army uh, research. I think we're getting now. Nah, we're only in 1862. That's not going to work. Um, up to 1864 before we can do any of that. We'll go ahead and do 1864 uniform. We're a little ahead on that, but it'll be nice to get some new unis. All right, back to the war. You can see the green is the places where we're having some success. If we can surround these units, maybe cut them off, then that should open the door to Atlanta. There we go. The fall of Charleston, South Carolina, the place where the war began, has fallen to our, for uh, our forces. So we're taking South Carolina now. If we can just swing these two sides in, that's really what I'd like to do. In fact, they don't have orders to advance that far. But I'm going to march these guys right up into Atlanta and try to cut this Confederate army off, uh, these single divisions that he's got all these places. We'll see if that's enough to end this war. I'm probably going to have to take New Orleans, probably Mobile. Uh, we haven't taken Vicksburg yet. There's the Butcher. And now we can get strike at the Confederacy, which is something I've been wanting from the beginning. Okay, well, I don't know what happened, but I think we took something, and we must have pushed for enough that it caused the surrender here in September of 1862. So at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, Ulysses S. Grant and George G. Meade's armies did battle, resulting in the defeat of Robert E. Lee's army. After the skirmish, Confederate General-in-Chief Robert E. Lee surrendered to General-in-Chief Ulysses S. Grant. With the surrender of the Chief General of the Confederate Army, the Confederacy crumbled. Hurrah! The Confederate States of America have signed a white peace. Meanwhile, George Thomas is dealing with the Sioux out west, and that should be over pretty soon. Uh, so we're pretty well going to have these Native American territories surrounded at that point. I guess we already did. But there we go, the end of the war. Right about a week after the historic Battle of Antietam, right about the time that Lincoln historically issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which would take effect on January 1st, we have ended the war. So um, we don't get to see the, the results, but I lost something like 350,000 men uh, compared to his, I'd say, 150,000. So it was really bloody, but we made it happen. 
So now we're bypassing focuses like the Emancipation Proclamation, March to the Sea, House Divided, Hallelujah, Up with the Stars. So a bunch of those Civil War, and I don't need Strike at the Confederacy anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and switch here. Uh, let's take a look. Reconstruction Era. Well, we can't start that yet. Um, we have to complete Reform the Army first. Where is that? Oh, we have to go down here. So we're going to have to get that, and we're going to have to get this too. So, Or is it one or the other? No, it requires all. So we're going to have to require, uh, research all of these things unless it bypasses those for me as well. So this is an interesting choice that I have. Uh, it was late into the night as the carriage arrived, and the astute president exited with his wife, as well as Major Henry Rathbone and his fiancée, Clara Harris. So cool uh, tidbit of history here. Ha uh, Rathbone and Harris were not supposed to attend. They were last-minute replacements. It was originally supposed to be General Grant and his wife. Well, Mrs. Grant, Julia Grant, had had some prior very bad experiences with Mrs. Lincoln, who was well-known to have had some mental health issues that were often taken out on generals' wives. General Ord's wife had a very bad run-in with Mrs. Lincoln. And Julia Grant really had no interest whatsoever in spending a night at the theater with Mrs. Lincoln. So they headed, uh, they were headed home uh, to their home at the time, I think, was in New Jersey to see their children. And I think it was when the Grants arrived in New Jersey that they got word that President Lincoln had been shot, and he was summoned right back to Washington. Uh, one other tidbit about this, Henry Rathbone, who was stabbed by John Wilkes Booth in the scuffle after he shot Lincoln, I believe, if I remember right, Henry Rathbone later murdered Clara Harris and ended up in an insane asylum himself. I'll have to check, but I think that's what happened. We get a choice, though. We can decide whether or not Abraham Lincoln dies, and we are definitely going to save him. Miracle at Ford's Theater! So, uh, oh, we have the Treaty of Wyoming, the Sioux. Uh, as the president was enjoying the play, Major Henry Rathbone had noticed John Wilkes Booth enter with a gun in his hand and tackled Booth before he could shoot the president. Henry was severely wounded by stabbing and would sadly die to his wounds hours later, but such a heroic act allowed the president to flee to safety, allowed reinforcements to apprehend Booth. Interesting. So we're going to go ahead and gather up the states formerly held by the Sioux. Now we have a plan to reintegrate the South. Now, if you ask me, one of the great mistakes in the history of our country was, and honestly, it all comes down to if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, uh, how, how badly we bumbled Reconstruction. And really, that boils down to one man, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was a Southern Democrat. Uh, who had remained loyal to the Union. He was the military governor of Tennessee. And in 1864, as Lincoln was thinking about reconciliation, he puts this Southern Democrat on the ticket. Well, nobody thought about the fact that what happens if Lincoln dies? Well, Lincoln gets assassinated. Now you've got a pro-slavery Southern Democrat running the country. And he basically screwed everything up for Reconstruction. And honestly, I think a lot of what you're seeing on TV today, a lot of the trouble that we have, a lot of what happened throughout history with um, the problems we've had with uh, people treat being treated equally, especially in the South, boils down to how we screwed up Reconstruction. So we got to make sure that we do this right. Be gentle, be cautious. Uh, reconstruction points. That'll be interesting. Demand total subjugation. Heck yeah. Um, all right. That's enough war for now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and drop military spending back down to 2% of the budget by executive order. Uh, I also need to look at what we can do here. I don't think we're able to do integration plan yet. I don't think we're still able to do reconstruction. We're still waiting to complete reform the army. So that's frustrating because it's going to take us a while uh, to get into all of this here. I don't think there's much else we can do either until we finish all of this stuff. All right, a couple things here. With the war over, the soldiers have begun to return to their homes. Although the Irish had helped us in the war, this does not exempt them from the mistreatment they would still face at home. However, the mistreatment is certainly not at the levels as it was before the war. Uh, so we're going to lose some recruitable population, some stability, but gain legislative power. Stability is at 57%. Radicals approach Lincoln. So um, Lincoln was kind of a moderate Republican. The radicals were the more uh, fringe group. These were the, the ones who wanted to, number one, severely punish the South, but also were pushing not only for freedom for the slaves, but full equality. Uh, if you've seen the Lincoln movie, radical Republicans would be guys, Republicans would be guys like Thaddeus Stevens. 
uh, and they were the ones who pushed to impeach Andrew Johnson because he wasn't going far enough. Uh, they were certainly uh, not nearly as kind of center politically as Lincoln was. Uh, so let's see, we can, we'll lose stability here. Um, radical Republicans become the ruling party. The union must come first. I think we'll do that. So what, we're the only ones who can rule the United States of America? Okay, yeah. So right now there's no Democratic Party. They were pretty well crushed by all of this. Although the, the Democrats did make a comeback, um, ended up taking the House sometime in the 1870s, I think. Um, and then, of course, win the White House for the first time. They almost won in 1876, probably did win in 1876, nearly won under Winfield Scott Hancock in 1880. And then finally, uh, Grover Cleveland was the only Democratic president uh, between Grant's election in 1868 and Woodrow Wilson's election in 1912. Uh, and Cleveland had two non-consecutive terms. Blacks leaving to Liberia. As they continue to struggle in the racially divided South, many African Americans have begun to seek refuge by taking a boat to our colonial state uh, in Liberia. So let's see what happens here. It'll be optional. We could make mandatory except if highly skilled. I lose a reconstruction point and lose. See, this was something Lincoln actually proposed. Um, you know, not a lot of people realize Abraham Lincoln at his heart, and he would have been the first one to admit this, was really a white supremacist. While he he favored um, the idea of limiting slavery, and he personally was opposed to the idea of slavery. I think in his heart, he always believed that blacks were inferior to whites. Um, but that was how a lot of people felt. And uh, that was a position that evolved for him as it involved for a lot of people. And he actually foresaw the issues with integrating blacks into society and uh, supported a lot of efforts to uh, send them back to Africa, to send them to a colony in Central America. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and make it, uh, we'll, we'll sponsor it, but we won't make it m mandatory. War economy mobilization is damaging the American economy. Yeah, let's go ahead and demilitarize that. All right, we'll go a little bit further here, and I think we'll wrap this episode up. That's been a lot that we've done, and the next episode is going to be primarily dealing with Reconstruction, integrating the South, and all of that. All right, we've completed reform the army, which means we can now turn our focus to reconstruction. And we'll take a look at this real quick before we wrap this episode up here. Um, that's going to begin the process of reconstruction, which is the era after the Civil War where everything was kind of put back together. Uh, disastrous reconstruction is over here. Uh, victorious reconstruction, of course, is what we're going to go with because we, we won the war. Uh, this is going to take... 70 days, then 35 days, and then we start to, to look at uh, passing the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the establishing relations, trade policy, political reform, suppressing riots, 14th Amendment, which uh, gave equal protection under the law to all citizens, and then the 15th Amendment, which gave uh, black males the right to vote. Uh, and then, of course, other things here. So we'll get into all that in the next episode. That will be focused on Reconstruction, and hopefully after that, we can start looking at foreign policy and where we go from here. So let me know your thoughts about all that. Use that comment section below. Drop a like if you would, and we will see you again soon. Thanks for watching.